Researchers are struggling to understand sudden infant death syndrome, the mysterious killer which takes the lives of young children when it's least expected. A new study by two New Zealand universities has identified a number of possible causes and ways of avoiding cot death. A significant discovery is the notion that babies who sleep in the same room as their parents for at least the first six months of life have a four times greater chance of survival. It may be because the, the parents are able to hear any sounds, but it's the only study that has been done that has brought up this information. So at this point in time, it's difficult to know how significant the study is. Lucy and Neil Montgomery are parents to adopt such a method. Having lost a child to SIDS almost 10 years ago, they aren't willing to take any chances. Their son Sean always sleeps in their room. You know, we can just go in and check on him all the time. But even when we're asleep, you're sort of listening out for, for any sort of little sounds or movements or anything that, you know, we might feel a bit, that's a bit strange. We're quite happy to have him in there for as long as we can stand it virtually. Mm. Extensive research into sudden infant death syndrome continues. Emma Ossian, NBN News. This site confronted Sandra Hards almost a week ago. Vast volumes of water gushing from a blocked drain into her neighbour's yard, through the fence and into her property. She says it's the third time such flooding has occurred in the past 18 months, proving both costly and inconvenient. So we can't keep living here with this happening and who knows whether it'll end up in the house one day. Yeah, it's not good, it goes through our garage. Um, we can't even do our gardens around the place because everything that we put there gets washed back into the pools. The San Remo area is prone to flooding, but Mrs Hard says something needs to be done to improve the drainage system. When the fellow from the council came just after the, the water had gone into the pool, he said that he found an eel on the, the neighbour's backyard. Why on council staff today investigated the problem, they say a large willow tree on another neighbouring property is to blame, its root system blocking the drain. After some initial clean-up work, they intend removing the tree early next week. Emma Ossian, NBN News. It was a tough assignment for the breakers. Wilson, Sanderson, Lowe, Zane and Keeper Carter were all out with injury. But the new blood took on the challenge. 19-year-old replacement keeper Adam Fittick showing he's got a great future. Shane Price went for a long-range shot, but while the breakers were fine-tuning their game, Brisbane was failing to finish off their moves, giving Newcastle an easier run. It wasn't until the second half that Glenn Sprod gave the breakers that precious goal after some clever lead-up. Breakers won, Brisbane nil. With their tails up, the breakers looked good. Man of the match, Scotty Thomas, keeping Jason Pollock under control. Darren Stewart was getting some raps too. This header kept Brisbane out with just seconds till the final whistle. Earlier, the breakers' youth squad defeated Northwest 7 nil. Peter Ryan, NBN News.
With three rounds already decided, the only female entrant, Lismore's Tanya Peacock, qualified for the grand final with a win in her final heat. Fellow Lismore drivers Ross Brim and John Leslight also won heats to qualify, as did John Pine, who started from pole, then began an enthralling battle for the lead with American Steve Francis. Stu Robertson and Francis also duelled for second, while Peacock and Bert Vosbergen were forced out with 22 laps remaining. Defending national champion Ron Pine was the next casualty after a gallant charge, but nothing was going to deny his brother a second Australian title, his first in 1990. The Eagles made a disastrous start to Game 2 this morning. Pitcher Dave Orzel giving up three runs before the Cougars registered their first out. The visitors led 4-0 at the top of the first. The Eagles getting off to a painful start at bat before recovering, only to endure another frustrating single-run loss. In Rugby League, the Knights have been seated second behind Manly for next month's World Sevens. While in Super League, the Mariners will play North Queensland in their opening match. Their first home game is under lights on Monday, March the 25th against Canberra. Where that will be staged remains unclear as speculation continues to grow that the Mariners are now unlikely to be based at number one sports ground. And ultra-distance runner Pat Farmer, who last year ran across America, has begun a 1,000-kilometre trek from Sydney to Tweed Heads. Part of an Australia Day promotion, Farmer is resting at Gosford tonight and is expected in Newcastle tomorrow. In surf life-saving, Swansea Belmont's Josh Blair has beaten a strong field to take out this afternoon's Iron Man at Newcastle Beach. Blair beating Matt Rees and Chad Griffith, helping Swansea Belmont to victory in the local carnival ahead of Redhead and Cooks Hill. The host club officially launched its new craft, but 16-year-old Swansea Belmont member Craig Scottman stole the show winning four events, including the under-16 Iron Man. On this 1.4 hectare beachfront site at Old Bar, developers plan to build a $7 million retirement resort called the Meridian. Prompted as the first of its kind on the north coast, the blueprints feature a 46-unit complex for over 55s, including a swimming pool and tennis court. However, some local residents have slammed the proposal, saying the development would not only ruin their views and decrease property values, but also have a detrimental effect on the sand dunes. Back in 89, 90, we had a very big seas, which washed a fair bit away, and, and now we've reclaimed it. The people of Lewis Street have worked very hard on their dunes, and we feel as though the increase of um, traffic flow, human traffic flow, will do untold damage to the dunes. With the complex to be built 60 metres from the beach and major landscaping to go in for dune stabilisation, developer Brian Hall says all guidelines have been strictly adhered to in the plans. Well, we feel as though they're a little bit unfounded. We've taken a considerable amount of care to make sure that the sand dunes will stay in place and the development that is going on here uh, will be an ongoing thing that stays within the family as it has for the last 50 years. Mr Hall said information sessions will be held over the long weekend at the Lewis Street site for anyone concerned about the proposal. Simone Cobb, NBN News.
take it in turns of serving in the dining room and also preparing. So what they're doing, if you like, our maximum capacity of the first intake in May is 75. Our maximum capacity of the first intake in May is 75 and we've got a number of applications and we've obviously done a, a number of interviews to date. in, in uh, locations where accommodation is supplied uh, along with meals such as the islands as I The Gresford Bank has been operating for the last 82 years, but once the National Australia closes, the nearest bank is half an hour's drive away, and for many elderly citizens, that's not good enough. My mother's on a bloody pension, and, and heaps of other people are on pensions. Now, they've got to have transport to get from A to B. Now, it, and lots of people I know in Gresford, I, unfortunately, I've got a car, I can still drive myself around, but there are other people in the area that cannot drive their car because they haven't got one. There will be a community meeting tomorrow night to address the closure of the bank, but in the meantime, residents are looking ahead. Well, it seems that the National Bank is set in their ways and, and we're going to attract, try to attract other bank agencies, credit union or building society to operate in Gresford. However, the National Australia says the closure is purely for financial reasons. The patronage has not been there and, you know, we, we had to make an economical decision and uh, we're just not going to have an operation uh, open if it's not going to prove viable to the overall performance of the bank. National Australia says keeping up with technology is inevitable. The bank believes telephone banking and electronic withdrawals will provide Gresford residents with their day-to-day -day banking needs. Philippa Scott, NBN News. Teenager Denny Ham has already put the super back into Supercross, and that's just in his practice rides. The youngster from Thornton in the Hunter Valley has won the Australian junior title, but now he must make the transition from a 125cc bike to the 250. The competition's a lot more fierce in the 250s, uh, more, more money involved, everyone's just really eager to get first place, so uh, that's probably the biggest change, except for the power and stuff, but yeah, mainly the, the money and the, the aggression that goes in this class. One rider certain to handle the pressure is fellow local and Pan Pacific champion Craig Anderson. He's among the most feared by defending champion Andrew McFarlane. Craig Anderson's definitely riding well and also Lee Hogan and Danny Ham. Um, I mean, we're all going to be out there to, to win the first round of the Australian Supercross titles and I've got the number one plate so I guess I've got to, um, got, got to go out there and show them who is the number one rider. McFarlane has been trialling his new Suzuki after 11 years on a Kawasaki as he prepares to defend his Australian crown. It'll be a test of stamina as much as speed, with the riders having to qualify through a series of heats on Newcastle's rock hard track. Up to 10,000 Supercross fans are expected on Saturday in the first of the five rounds to decide the Australian Championships. Richard O'Leary, NBN News.
Orion and Sydney Electricity were merged to create superpower supplier MetNorth in a scene repeated across the state. But not everybody is convinced that bigger is better, with fears that this is the first step towards the privatisation of the electricity industry. We are very concerned if they're, they're degenerated into bureaucracies with no democratically elected people and with the potential for privatisation. That is a huge problem. The mergers are supposed to improve efficiency, with fewer staff needed to provide cheaper electricity. But opponents claim regional centres will be financially disadvantaged, with the profits from these savings going to the state instead of the local economy. To in fact uh, put hundreds of millions of dollars uh, of the, uh, uh, the people's money uh, into consolidated state revenue and uh, quite frankly it was in effect stealing the people's money and uh, putting it into the state coffers. But a spokesperson for the State Energy Minister, Michael Egan, says the amalgamations will make regional areas more competitive. It's claimed businesses will have their electricity bills halved within five years. The state government also says the amalgamations have saved the regional suppliers from being destroyed by privatised Victorian suppliers when the national power grid is introduced later this year. Meanwhile, workers are still considering the voluntary redundancy offers made by MetNorth yesterday, with the power giant to shed 200 jobs in the Hunter. The Electrical Trades Union will meet with the management next week to discuss concerns about the redundancy packages. Richard O'Leary, NBN News. Forty-nine-year-old Group Captain John Richards is settling into his new job, replacing Group Captain Donahue. Group Captain Richards likens his position to a mayor of a small town in charge of 2,000 airmen and women at the base. While it is not his decision, he says the Williamtown base is in the running to accommodate the Hercules operations from the Richmond base. Certainly there is suggestion that... Uh the C-130 fleet is moved out of um, Richmond, but that's uh, not for another 15 years or so. Meanwhile, the group captain is keen to pursue efficiency improvements at the base and continue to maintain a strong link with the outside community. And that means facing up to a continuing problem. Uh, noise is the uh, principal concern and, uh, and indeed in the last uh, 12 months my predecessor has gone a long way to um, uh, alleviate some of the uh, noise concerns that the base does, uh, does generate. After arriving in town yesterday, the Scots wasted little time in testing out the Belmont layout. They played down the fact they'll be right at home in the wind on the seaside course, and if their golf's no good, they'll certainly find work as comedians. But don't look at the scores though, because it'll just be... If you're expecting us to shoot good when the wind's blowing, there's no chance of that. It's just a case of having to adjust, and if the wind blows well, it blows. Both Craig and Michael have won Scottish Amateur Championships in the last two years and had an impressive international field. They've played down their chances and say they'll be happy just to make the cut. It's been uh, minus 20 in Scotland in the last couple of weeks, so we're just out here to get some sun and get a wee bit of practice for the season back in Scotland. All right then, but you're both playing off uh, plus two? Don't tell anybody that. <laughs> we're, we're, that that's, what we're, that's what is on the scorecard. But. And Craig needs plenty of sun. He was quick to point out he wasn't wearing long white socks. That was just his Scottish tan. But you can never underestimate anyone who hails from the home of golf. So we're just going to do our best and hopefully do it for Scotland. More than 50 unregistered small pleasure craft have been seized since the campaign began. They're now in council storage. Any craft not displaying a current yellow registration sticker and left on reserves such as Shoal Bay and Soldiers Point are being targeted.
the aim is to tidy up the visual visual effect so that eventually all the dinghies will be stored properly on racks, get, get rid of the abandoned craft. Council Ranger Roy Worth says there are also concerns the abandoned dinghies pose a safety risk. One we picked up yesterday, we, we were very concerned they might have had snakes under it, uh, which would be a, uh, a risk to, to kids. Mr Worth says there is no charge to pick up a dinghy, but anyone wishing to store the craft on a reserve is charged a $50 fee. And while the crackdown is being welcomed by many, some holiday makers say their dinghies are also being removed. They're urging the council to exercise discretion. Emma Seossian, NBN News. It was a rocky start for this pup. While his mum, Goldie, struggled to give birth to eight others, this little one was born dead. His owner, Barry Kelly, discovered the sorry sight on arriving home from a night out just before Christmas. The owner of a local aquatic centre and a qualified resuscitation instructor, Barry quickly grabbed the tiny bundle and began some basic CPR. With a bit of quick thinking by the wife, she grabbed the straw from the kitchen and I inserted it down the, the throat and uh, then started ventilating the lungs. And with my thumb I was able to uh, compress his chest to give him a heartbeat using the CPR technique. After 10 minutes, the pup eventually took its first real breath. Barry says it was a great feeling to see it live. Yeah, really great feeling to see the life come back into something that was, was gone. Several weeks later and the animal is still fit and healthy, his father, Rebel, is never far away, but the pup is happiest by mum's side. Barry says it's another good reason why people should learn resuscitation, as you never know when the skill may come in handy. Emma Ossian, NBN News. It's a life that many children dream of, being born into a famous circus family. I've been in the circus all my life. Born in Bathurst, been with the circus for, since I was three weeks of age. Stafford is the son of the former printer's devil, Pierce Bullen, who started his own circus in the Depression. Stafford began working with elephants when he was 10 years old, and 60 years on, he's still with them, saying, there's never a dull moment. So Bimbo and uh, Peggy were eating the carrots and all of a sudden Bimbo lets out a trumpet and takes off across the field, brings the other two back to share the carrots with them. Bimbo, Sabu and Siam have trunks full of tricks. Uh, Sabu was pulling out all these noxious weeds and putting them to one side and going back to the same spot because it was all cleared of them and eating the grass. <laughs> Very intelligent today. Stafford Bullen works with his son Craig. The old man of the circus has no plans of retiring yet. His philosophy? He just takes one day at a time. Philippa Scott, NBN News. Make sure you don't go out over your limits and even if someone is in danger themselves, make sure you can get someone that can rescue them. Russell Crowe, better known for his acting career and movies such as The Quick and the Dead, where he co-starred with Sharon Stone, is now turning his attention to his musical career.
He's on tour throughout New South Wales with his five-member band, 30 Odd Foot of Grunts, promoting their new single, aptly named Photograph Kills. Today in Newcastle, preparing for tonight's performance at the castle, the actor says music has always been his release. In front of the camera on a, on a film set is very controlled. You, you sit back in the lounge room and you kind of work out the details of the performance. Whereas with a band, it's like moment to moment, you know. The video clip for Photograph Kills was shot on the set of Russell's most recent movie, Virtuosity, which also stars Denzel Washington. But if you take out Denzel's fee, it's about a <clears throat> $33 million video clip. <laughs> As fire ripped through the house in Francis Street, Paxton, just after midnight, 12-year-old Wayne Dennis sounded the alarm. He woke his parents and rescued two of his brothers from the flames. But seven-year-old Sean was still inside. His father and a neighbour tried to find him. The, the heat of it was incredible, you know. It was just, just, it was just like a fireball and the, it was um, like a really black acrid smoke come through the place you couldn't breathe. And the fire brigade arrived and with the building still ablaze, two officers searched for the child, one finding him in a room adjacent to the lounge room. He, he then lifted the uh, child from the position he found him, passed him out through a, an open window to try and uh, commence resuscitation. But it was too late. Seven-year-old Sean was dead. Well, it's been a very tragic circumstance. There's been a, uh, a fire which we believe to be accidental in nature and we have finished with one deceased uh, person. The house was fitted with one smoke detector, but it was in the hallway outside the kitchen. The fire brigade is advising people to use a number of smoke detectors and to place them throughout their homes. The fire and Sean Dennis's death will be the subject of a coroner's inquest. Jane Anderson, NBN News. Despite being an Australian representative since 1994, Natalie Ward still had doubts about her inclusion for Atlanta. While holidaying in Brisbane last Friday, her fears were allayed and a dream came true. Yeah, I've always hoped for it. Watching the Olympics on TV every year that it's on, you think, oh, I wish I could be there. So for softball to get in and for me to get in the team is great. And her parents, Graham and Helen, have received an unexpected windfall. The three went to Sydney today to investigate an unexpected trip to the Olympics through the 20-year-old selection. Well, National Pack put together a deal and for the youngest player in each Olympic sport, they get their parents flown over for free, so that was me. So mum and dad are stoked. <laughs> it's been a tremendous effort to sort of um, foster the kids and you know, look after them in their sport. And uh, I must say that we've, we've enjoyed it. To have this culminate in the end with a, with a trip um, to America, the Olympic Games, is absolutely tremendous. A hectic program awaits Natalie in the build-up for Atlanta, starting next month with a test series against Chinese Taipei. The shortstop second baser is confident Australia will be among the medals come July. Well, I think we'll do really well. I think the teams to beat are USA, China and Japan, but I think that any team can be beaten. So if we're in form and if we play well, I think we'll have a good chance. This is music 1996 style, loud, challenging and at times chaotic. The Big Day Out Festival toured the country with 57 Australian and international acts. In Sydney last week, 40,000 fans left their troubles behind. 
It's a scene that's being repeated more than ever. Festivals reliving the days of Woodstock, young people experiencing countercultures, rebelling against mainstream values. Just this summer we've had Somersault, Rock Above the Falls, the Byron Bay Arts and Music Festival and Home Bake. Some are falling flat. Ken West from the Big Day Out says the concept is being worn out. It's too much of the similar thing. And even though these festivals are totally different, the concept is still the fact that you stand out in the sun or rain or whatever it is for 12 hours, run around like a madman and, and hopefully enjoy yourself. Tism were enjoying themselves. Australia's new breed of musicians is turning heads with the world talking about our music. American MTV was at the big day out. Aussie bands attracting just as much attention as the international acts like Rage Against the Machine, Billy Bragg and the Jesus Lizard. The heat was all too much, it was time to cool down and with the night sky falling in, Australia's most famous neighbour and now international pop star Kylie Minogue was on stage. Somehow Kylie looked out of place. Police, fire officers, the Tweed District and Brunswick Valley Rescue Services were called to the crash just before six this evening. Unfortunately we've got a 45 year old male driver deceased and no other vehicles involved. The driver from Queensland lost control of his rig on a sweeping bend 20 kilometres south of Mwillimbar. The semi tipped over, the cabin somehow catching on fire. Diesel spilt into a nearby waterway but fire officers were able to contain the flow. The driver had been heading south with a load of frozen meat. While some vehicles were allowed through the crash site, most were forced to be redirected via the coast road. Peter Ryan, NBN News, Late Edition. The melee between the breakers and the Knights has been the subject of a Soccer Australia tribunal hearing which will continue tonight. But part of the drama was unravelled today. The national body announced it would take no action against Hickman, who was the only player sent off in the scuffle. It would have been tragic to see him sideline. Thankfully a little bit of sanity has prevailed and a little bit of fairness and justice has been rewarded to him and into the club, so it'll be great to see him on the park uh, tomorrow night against Moore. His teammates Craig Carter and Darren Stewart will learn their fate later tonight. Meantime, the resumption of the Ericsson Cup will see one of the Breakers' former teammates return to Newcastle. How they control him is certain to affect the outcome. Obviously the, the main draw card tomorrow night is Warren Spink. There's not too many better strikers in Australia than Spink. Uh, also been named in the Socceroos squad earlier today, so obviously he'll have a point to prove and uh, be looking to score a couple of goals and give it to us, I suppose. Meantime, work has begun at Breakers Stadium to prepare the ground for the Hunter Mariners' first Premiership game. The ground has been lengthened and will be ready for the Mariners' match with Canterbury on March 17. With the temperature again climbing into the 30s, the weather wasn't exactly conducive to training. The night swapping Denker up for sunscreen. 
previous winners of the tournament, Newcastle play Canada and New Zealand on Saturday's opening day and are seated second for the event. A few new guys in the team and they've been fitting in good in training so there's no reason why uh, we can't live up to expectations, you know, those of the public and probably also the expectations of ourselves. One of those new faces is John Carlaw, who with another reserve grade flyer, Darren Albert, will be out to make an impression in his initial steps towards a possible first grade spot for 96. There's a lot of wingers in the club and uh, you know, I get the first chance to establish a spot there and hopefully I'll go around. Uh -huh.